I want to welcome all of you on behalf of our center, our school, the university, and our co-sponsors, the Institute for Asian American Studies, the Department of Political Science, the Department of Women's Studies, the Joyner Center for the Study of War and its Consequences. I would like to acknowledge some of the elected officials besides the mayors. We are going to spend the whole time on the women mayors tonight, but I'd like to acknowledge a few of the other uh, dignitaries who are in the room. We have Representative Alice Wolf, who is uh, on our board and is a great friend of the center. We have City Councilor Sam Yoon, who was here for a little bit. Is he still here? Stand up. There you go, City Councilor Sam Yoon. Very nice to have you here with us. Carol Donovan was a longtime uh, state representative, and we're very happy to have you here and are on our board as well. And representing the mayor of Boston, we have Marie Turley. Please stand up, Marie. Marie is on our board and is a, the executive director of the Boston Women's uh, Commission uh, for the city of Boston. So, uh, and if there are other elected officials that come in, we will let you know uh, shortly. If there are any that I didn't mention, please stand up and let yourself be known. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any others that we missed? City Methuen. City Council, the mayor. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll be speaking about issues of the mayors and city councilors shortly, but first I want to just tell you a little bit that about the center. We are the only women's educational and research center at a public university in the state of Massachusetts. And as our center for women in politics and public policy, we are very proud of many firsts. Uh, for, we, are first in the, we have the first in the nation graduate certificate program for women in politics and public policy. The founder, Betty Tamor, is here with us. Betty? It was, it was founded over 35 years ago, and we have over 600 women who have been in positions of leadership across the Commonwealth, the nation, and the world. I'd like to ask the students of this year's class of, for the Women in Politics and Public Policy program to stand up and face the camera. We're being filmed tonight, so uh, uh, this is our class. And many of the students in our class go on and do internships or do internships as part of the program in the state legislature and in nonprofits. And many uh, state and local organizations and government offices. So we know that they, as being, when they are in the program, are doing a service to the people of the Commonwealth, and after they leave, they also do. So I'd like actually our alums to stand up. I know that we have quite a few alums that responded to our invitation. There are many of the women who come, come back. And since we're talking about the program, I would like to acknowledge Donna Stewartson, our Associate Program Director, who is really a terrific person. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about the program, there are program brochures among our materials table. And please talk to Donna anytime. She's a delightful person, and we're very proud of having you be part of the center. Thank you. Uh, so now I would like to say that we are also uh, achieving another first it is fitting that we celebrate International Women's Day a couple days later, um, but we're celebrating Women's History Month tonight by honoring, I think for the very first time, the women who are serving the Commonwealth as mayors in their municipalities. Your presence here tonight demonstrates that even when we are in the midst of a presidential election that is gripping and all eyes are on, seem to be on the presidential race, Tip O'Neill, may have been right when we say that all politics is local and we care very deeply about the governance of the cities of Massachusetts. So I welcome you all tonight. Our mi center's mission is to promote women's leadership in politics and policy making by providing a graduate certificate program in, for education of women, also for conducting research that makes a difference in women's lives, and serving as a resource for women from diverse communities across the Commonwealth. We could not accomplish this mission without the support of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and the 
McCormick Graduate School, of which we are a part. So I'd like to invite Chancellor Motley to the podium to give the university greetings, and he will be followed then by Dean Crosby of McCormick Graduate School. Chancellor Motley, a good friend of the centers. Good evening, everybody. So glad to uh, see all of you here. So grateful to see all of our students here. We look forward to these kind of opportunities for our students to see all of the wonderful leadership that happens to be in this Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's going to be represented up on this stage um, this evening as part of this panel. I'm so grateful to be in your presence. I'm honored by it. I'm inspired by it. I'm looking forward to hearing what I can of what you have to say tonight. I hope I find something in it that will be as helpful um, to me as I move through um, the challenges of being the chancellor of this wonderful university, of which there are few. <laughs> because of all of you. It's an honor to stand here as the eighth chancellor of this wonderful university. Welcome to, yes, welcome to the University of Massachusetts here in Boston. Do us a favor, when you walk from this beautiful space, tell someone else about us. We've hidden out here for a while, but we're not hiding now. We are out here now doing wonderful things. You'll hear about many of those because, as you know, our illustrious leader here, Carol, she doesn't miss the opportunity to let you know that. But we also have inspiring leadership in our dean here who will be coming before you next. And I know this is not a speech tonight, it's a welcome, so I'm going to get out of the way. But I'm delighted to welcome you to the 25th Women's Research Forum, Women Mayors in Massachusetts Making History, Meeting Challenges. This event is sponsored by my office, along with a whole lot of folk here, the Institute for Asian American Studies, Department of Women's Studies, Department of Political Science, the William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences, among others. And so I'm so grateful for all of you for coming together as we should as an institution in a collaborative way to present programs that make significant difference. I'm, pretty, I'm very pleased that we're joined by members of the mayor's staff. Mayor Menino spends relentless amounts of time in this community, particularly here on this campus. And so we're grateful that if he couldn't be here, at least there is someone here representing his staff. To NECN's Allison King, thank you as well. Distinguished members of our panel, Kimberly Driscoll, who happens to be our mayor in Salem, Claire Higgins from Northampton, Susan Kay from, Gloucester, uh, from Weymouth, Carolyn Kirk from Gloucester, Jeanette A. McCarthy from Waltham, Denise Simmons from Cambridge, and a graduate, and I'm sure there's some other graduates of the University of Massachusetts here as well, but Nancy Stevens from Marlboro and also Lisa Wong from Fitchburg. Thank all of you. Let's give them a round of applause in advance. I can only imagine how busy you are. And so thank you for finding some space in your schedules to be here. A mayor's job is never easy. It's most certainly never completed. While a mayor must provide visible leadership, must also provide independent spirit, but also must work collaboratively, as I mentioned early, with others, always keeping clear focus on solving the concrete problems and issues that require immediate attention. It is not an easy job. It is not an easy job. It is not an easy job. But effective mayors can bring out positive changes in communities in the lives of individuals. And so know that you make a difference. Tonight, we're going to have the opportunity to look inside of this discussion from the outside, thinking about the potential for change and all the effective mayors represent as they come before you. So I'm very excited about that. We're going to look at an opportunity to examine some of the history and some of the current challenges faced by our women mayors here and in the Commonwealth. So thank you, Carol Hardy Fanta, for this, for this opportunity for me to come before you and everyone else 
at the center who had the opportunity to put this together. Thank you for organizing this event. Thank you for, for being here to participate. I am out of your way. Thank you so much. There are a lot of changes going on in this campus with uh, Chancellor Motley. The uh, one that's most significant to people like me is when average white guys have to come up here and stand at a podium after he's been up here, but <laughs> it's made tough a little challenging. Um, women's office holding, as you will be discussing, as you'll see in your research, uh, elected officials um, amongst women and municipal officials has been flat for the last 10 years, from 1997 to 2007, at 20-21% of municipal officials have been the same for the last 10 years, actually dropped, and it's come back up a little bit to that 20-21%. So something isn't working out there, yet the fact that you all are here, that the mayors are here, 25% of, of the state's mayors are women, which is fairly extraordinary, I think suggests that that progress is being made, um, but it is very, very slow progress. Um, and that makes us particularly proud at the McCormick Graduate School to have Carol Hardy Fanta's Center on Women in Politics and Public Policy that takes a very proactive role in researching, advocating, and educating uh, on behalf of generating activity amongst women in politics and public policy in Massachusetts. Um, it's a leadership role. Uh, Carol and Donna and the others um, keep all of us honest. And I'm a new dean, and uh, I've been helped with your uh, attentions. Um, but the McCormick Graduate School takes great pride in having this center be one of the centerpieces of our makeup. So thank you, Carol. I'm glad to have you here. And thank you all to you mayors, and welcome to uh, UMass Boston. Thank you, Steve, and uh, the Chancellor, uh, especially for um, helping sponsor this event and for uh, contributing in so many ways. Our center really could not do these kind of events or um, the work that we do without your support. So thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, now. Uh, we are going to turn to present. When we decided to hold this event, we thought we're going to honor women mayors. And then we said, well, if we're going to honor women mayors, we need to actually honor you with something that you could take away besides the opportunity to come up here and speak. So as we call your name, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to get the mic. And as we call your name, we are going to invite one of our co-sponsors to come up and join us in providing you the award. Then you can move up and take your place on the stage, uh, and then we will have the panel begin. So I've invi we've invited a number of co-sponsors and colleagues to join us. So Donna Stewartson, would you come up and honor, we're going to honor, uh, I will come down there. And we Very good. First, we would like to invite Claire Higgins, the mayor of Northampton, to come up. Claire has been a wonderful friend of the center and uh, to come all the way from Northampton. We'd like to read this to you. It's from the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy in recognition of your contribution to the governance of your city and your inspiration to women across the Commonwealth. Women mayors in Massachusetts making history and meeting challenges, March 11, 2008. Thank you very much. Invite now the Honorable Kimberly Driscoll, Mayor of Salem. <laughs> and now, uh, thank you, Donna, very much. Uh, Paul Watanabe from the Institute for Asian American Studies has been a sponsor of this event tonight. And we are disappointed that uh, Lisa Wong was not able to uh, attend tonight, um, but uh, we know she's here in spirit. And uh, I know Paul is uh, also going to uh, present to the Honorable Susan Kay, Mayor of Weymouth.
Right. Uh, I checked to see whether she picked up my garbage day. She's actually my mayor, so. Uh, <laughs> and she did, so she now gets the award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. And you can proceed up to the stage. Uh, and also, you can. Pre uh, Paul is going to join us in presenting to the Honorable Nancy Stevens, Mayor of Marlboro. Congratulations, and thank you very much for being with us tonight. Okay, <laughs> Professor Aaron O'Brien is here representing the Department of Political Science, who is another co-sponsor of our event. Hello, hi, how are you? And you will be presenting to the start, just kidding. <laughs> the Honorable Carolyn Kirk, Mayor of Gloucester. <laughs> no. okay. Thank you very much for coming. Please take your place. And also presenting to the Honorable Nancy Stevens, Mayor of Marlboro. I wish I had a problem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's really good. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Sorry. The Honorable Jeanette McCarthy, Mayor of Waltham. Thank you. I'm sorry. I know I said that. Okay. Oh, you Thank you very much. You're welcome. Glad you could come. Thank you. And now, Krista Kelleher. Thank you, uh, Professor O'Brien. Representing uh, the Center for Women in Politics, and we'd like to also invite uh, Rita Arditi, who is representing the Women's Studies Department. And we'll be presenting to the Mayor of Cambridge, E. Denise Simmons. Thank you. Very good. Four other mayors had to send their regrets, but we are pleased to be honoring them tonight as well. Uh, they will be receiving their plaques um, when either by in person when we visit them or in the uh, courier. And that is Susan Dawson, mayor of Agawam, Christine Forgey, mayor of Greenfield, Constantina Lukes, mayor of Worcester, and as I said, Lisa Wong, mayor of Fitchburg. So I'd like to welcome all of the mayors uh, who are taking their places on the stage. We're thrilled to see you up there. And now I would like to uh, turn it over to Krista Kelleher, who is the research director at the center. Tonight's event is not only a celebration of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, tonight marks the center's 25th Women's Research Forum. The center hosts a forum each fall and spring to highlight the breadth and depth of research conducted by female scholars here at UMass Boston. Through our forums, we aim to inform and educate by, by sharing important research findings with the community at large. As a center that works to advance women's political leadership, our forums are also intended to inspire and empower, as Dean Crosby Dean Crosby has already <laughs> alluded to. It is my hope that tonight's forum will motivate all of you to think about how women are making history in Massachusetts and the challenges to political equality that remain. Most importantly, I hope that this, in, this evening's discussion inspires you to consider how you might contribute to women's increased participation in local politics. I am pleased to now introduce the center's senior research associate, Paige Ransford, who will briefly discuss women in municipal government in Massachusetts to set the stage for our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. I'm gonna make this brief for two reasons. We are running late and I'm very nervous. I tried to get Chancellor Motley to read my speech, but he wouldn't. <laughs> And I felt like I was much better suited to handing the awards, but um, I'm Paige Ransford. Good evening, welcome everybody. Before we hear from our panel, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of women's representation in municipal politics in Massachusetts. The Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy has been tracking women's political representation since its inception in 1994. 
In 2003, spurred on by the Women's Political Summit, we chose to put a greater focus on women in municipal government. And we are one of the only centers in the United States to concentrate this much on women in municipal government. So why do we address this? Why do we look at women's representation? First, we recognize that local representation and leadership do matter. Cities and towns provide essential services and serve an important function in our system of democracy, and women need to be included in this system. Second, women's public service at the local level serves as a pipeline to higher office, including state legislative or state executive office, as well as congressional. And finally, our research documents the lack of gender parity at the local level, allows us to educate others about women in local government, and leads us to address important questions. Everybody should have received a copy of our latest fact sheet on their seat. If you didn't, please be sure and get one on the way out. This fact sheet provides you with an overview of women's leadership in municipal government in Massachusetts. It's important to realize that our work here focuses on the governing bodies of cities and towns in the Commonwealth. We're looking at city and town councils, members of board of selectmen and aldermen. We do hope in the future, we do expect in the future to look at school boards, school committee and other um, officials. But as Dean Crosby points out, in Massachusetts, the status of women on local governing bodies has shown a little improvement o over the last two to four years, though gender parity at the local level is still far from reality. The current rate, as Dean Crosby also pointed out, is 20.6, which is an increase of 1% since the last election cycle in 2005, but it's virtually the same as it was a decade ago. Currently, more than a third of the cities and towns in Massachusetts have no women serving on their elected municipal boards. Add this to the 127 cities and towns that only have one woman, and we are left with limited or no representation by women in many communities across the Commonwealth. Why do we care about the extent to which women participate in these governing bodies? Well, beyond the need to ensure equal representation of women, we know that the voices and perspectives of women in local government matter. Studies suggest that women can increase the delivery of services to more women and families, engage in collaborative working, and encourage other women to run for office. When, when we look at mayors, we now have the highest rate of female mayors ever in the history of Massachusetts, which is great. So currently we have 11 cities that have a female mayor. It's important to remember that this is not capture the women who serve as town moderators, town managers, or other um, similar capacity in cities and towns. Um, so the Commonwealth has seen a recent surge of women leaving our cities and towns, and this increase for Massachusetts is significant, especially if we look at the fact that the Center for Women in American Politics at Rutgers puts in their website that 16% of mayors in the United States are women. So we're doing great comparatively. But the question persists, why has Massachusetts not achieved a higher degree of equality for women in the local political arena? If we make up 52% of the population here, our communities cannot afford to overlook the insights and expertise of over half their residents. So at, the t at a time when all eyes are focused on the national election, we think it is extremely important to recognize the work being done all across the Commonwealth by women who are making history and meeting challenges. So I'm eager to hear from our distinguished panel. So I would like to move on and I would like to introduce Allison King, political reporter for New England Cable News who will moderate this discussion. Allison made her political... Allison made her political reporting debut at NECN in 1996. Since then, she's covered three presidential races and a wide range of New England political stories. She's earned a number of awards for her work and contributed to NECN's 2000 DuPont Award. She holds an undergraduate degree from Colgate University and a master's degree from NYU School of Journalism. And she and her husband live here in Boston. Thank you, Alice.
Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, and particular thanks to Carol Hardy Fanta um, for thinking of me, and she has been a victim of mine over the years on the interview side, so um, she always does a great job, as are many, and many other people here at UMass that I come over to interview, so thank you for that, too. Um, you know, I've done so many stories about the lack of women elected leaders in Massachusetts over the years. This is really a pleasure to be able to um, celebrate the positive and the people leading the way over here. Uh, and uh, so I'm grateful for that. I also, this is, I just have to mention this, I was at Harvard, Harvard's Institute of Politics for some event a couple days ago, and I was walking out and I saw this, the Harvard Political Review, which it says, the age of the mayor. And I thought, wow, isn't that relevant to what we're sort of going to be talking about? And I just have to read this little passage inside in the intro. It says, um, in, in part, local governments have become the front line of policy making. Increasingly, mayors are entering the spotlight by tackling issues that the president and Congress will not touch. And in taking on these difficult issues, mayors are proving themselves to be remarkably adept at generating effective solutions. So there you have it, and uh, <laughs> there you all are. But um, so with that, on that note, I'd just like to jump in. I want to mention this is a discussion, so feel free to sort of jump in and, and um, add your thoughts. I, keep it moving a little bit because there, the time is sort of short. Um, for, we want to get a lot of questions in. Uh, first of all, I want, I'm curious to know what some of the most important issues that you all have to deal with as as mayors, as, as, and the challenges, I mean, you think of potholes and um, pub public safety, property taxes, education. How do you prioritize? What do you put at the top of your issues list? I'm going to start with you, Mayor Simmons, because you're right next to me over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably have the fewest days on the job. Uh, I had said to uh, Denise when I was walking in, a young lady named Denise, there was no playbook when I first started, you know, in politics. There was nothing to go by, and I just, see this wonderful opportunity and I'm glad to be a part of it. You asked what are the most important issues uh, that you deal with in your position as mayor. You know, in Cambridge we elect the mayor very strangely. The, the city council elects the mayor and so it was my colleagues that uh, made, made, it, made it so that I could serve in this position. But before that I was a city councilor and the issues that were important to me as a city council that remain important to me as the mayor, one is education for children. That's the top of my at my the top of my list. If we do not educate our children well, then we really are going to not have a very very good future because the kids are the bottom line, and they've always been the bottom line for me as a parent who has her children in the Cambridge Public Schools. But and I'm, I know I'm talking fast because I'm trying to <laughs> get it all in. The other issues that are important to me is also housing. So it's education and housing. Now Cambridge is a resource resource rich city. We have not had to lay off teachers. We have a AAA bond rating. We, we are able to do a lot around housing, but what is prohibitive is making sure that people have access to that housing or making sure all children are learning in our schools. And just recently, we had a housing forum in um, Cambridge to talk about our, ho our housing practices. And what we found was that although we have put um, online about 1,700 units of affordable housing. We, by our policies, have been discriminating against families with larger children because we have been building ones and twos. So now one of, the, one of the hard things that we have to do, or one of the things that I feel that I have to do as mayor, is to make sure I keep the council's head in place on the agenda of developing a policy that says we will man make it mandatory that we will have more family-centered housing. And that's really difficult because you want to have as much housing as possible. But, it, and, but by having more units, we are allowing for less large families. Very quickly on the, um, the, the whole idea of education. Educa Cambridge has a very good uh, school system. One, wonderful practices, wonderful policies, but a third of our children, and most of those children are children of color, are failing. That's a crime. No child should get less than a great education, particularly in a city that has so much to give. And so one of the difficult tasks that I have is to keep the school committee, and as the mayor um, of the city, you also chair the school committee, is to remind the school committee, no matter how well we're doing, if we are not educating all children, then we have failed. And then the last thing that has to do with education um, 
in a way, is parent involvement. Making, when I joined the school committee 16 years ago, the first thing I did was to work on making sure that we had a policy that said families would be involved and could be main involved. And just making sure that we fund the programs well enough so parents can stay engaged. You know, you have two types of parents. There's the proactive parent and the reactive parent. The reactive parents is the parents that come when they're called. They come to PTA, they come to the school place, but they don't get involved on a higher level than that because sometimes they, their culture prevents them from doing so. They think they're not supposed to be there, so they don't get as involved. And so what my job is, particularly as a parent of color, is to make sure those parents of color are are present in their schools and that they get the information from the school so that they can help their children navigate the education system. I will yield the floor, as we say, in the council chamber to uh, my colleagues. And someone, feel free to jump in. Obviously, Cambridge has many different issues than uh, some of you in other cities and towns. Jeanette McCarthy from Waltham. Um, when I decided to run for mayor, my mother said, what do you want to do that for? They're just going to talk all about you. <laughs> and then my father said, what do you want to do that for? It's a thankless job, and you'll probably win, and then what are you going to do? <laughs> well, needless to say, my mother and father were both correct. Um, but you get an opportunity, if you really love your community, to do some things. There are three areas that I think that I deal with every single day. Personnel is the biggest issue of any mayor. 1,500 employees. The next biggest issue is your relationship with the city council and the school committee, of which that's always going to be there. And the third is with the public, which you're always on 24 hours a day. So in all of that, they want to see the mayor. You have email, you have mail, you have appearances, and you have a continual presence on. And I was very shy when I was a young kid, and it took me a while to get over that. So once you realize that, then you put that all together to try to do your initiatives. In Waltham, we're building eight schools at once. Not one of them was finished when I became mayor. And the other thing is you always have to remember, well, everything takes so long, so you have to be thinking about 10, 12 months ahead of time what you want to do so you get it on the right cycle. But it's a wonderful job most days. Now, today I was on Channel 25. One of my employees drove into the um, police station, and so you just never know. But um, there's, no, there's no drive up window there? You just never know what you're going to do. So, but I think, you know, uh, I, had, I was the solicitor for Waltham for seven years, and every mayor that I knew said the same thing. Personnel is the biggest challenge that you have because people are human. Okay? Thank you, Mayor. I would have to agree. Susan Kaye from the town of Weymouth. First and foremost, on becoming mayor, I found out thick skin, tough skin, is what you have to have right away. It is incumbent upon the mayor of, of any city or town, we call ourselves a town to be quaint. <laughs> <laughs> we, the, it is very important to realize the deadlines and the demands placed upon you because that is your role in formulating your timelines within the charter. You have to come through with what the charter demands. But to be very honest with you, I prepared some notes, the most pressing demand on my time has been to maintain a level of comfort within our departments and our employees. You must realize that upon entering um, my position, these employees were dealt with a fiscal year deficit, current fiscal year of $1.4 million, and the realization that three to four point million dollar deficit coming up on fiscal year 09. Obviously, this is going to affect the formulation of budgets. In addition to that, 16 bargaining units whose contracts expired last June. I walked into a full plate on January 1st, trying to minimize cuts. Um, as far as women in politics, I, I agree it's a tough go. I believe, though, that we as elected officials, so we can look toward hiring women. I found that by being um, playing the role of executive secretary for three years in an adjacent town really prepared me I ran for mayor some years ago when the first form of, when the uh, mayoral form of government, <coughs> excuse me, came into view in Weymouth and lost. And I really wasn't ready. After serving in a role where you actually run a town, run a municipality, I felt ready. I was really cocky. Went at it. <laughs> and I think I was lucky to win. <laughs> it's a tough go, but uh, I do feel ready for it. But hiring women is the first step so that they can feel comfortable. I don't know. It's true. It's true. I don't know if we're not, if we're just not electing women 
I think that many women don't run. They fail to feel comfortable enough to do the role, and yet you are. We all are. Thank you. Hi, Nancy Stevens from the City of Marlboro. I think Jeanette uh, hit it perfectly. The number one issue, and the one that I don't think I was prepared as prepared for for me, is personnel issues. We have uh, 1,300 employees and 1,300 different personalities. And the issues that come up every day, there's no two days that are alike. But I think the number one thing that, that guides all of us, and I think uh, Kim can attest to this, is the financial issues. Um, the financial impact of, of everything, every decision that you make, really steers every decision. You have to realize that you know we can't. We want to be responsible for the constituents that we represent. We want to make sure that our students get the best education, but that we don't tax out our seniors. There's a constant balancing act, and it's one that, it, that it's this very fine line that you have to walk between balancing the interests of all your constituents, your businesses. We have a large industrial commercial base. So I have to be conscious of the fact that every decision I make not only affects our residents in terms of you know, services, we have trash pickup, human services, but we have to look at, we're facing right now an $80 million upgrade to our wastewater treatment plants, and we're a unique community in that we have two treatment plants. So that puts us at double the trouble. And I want, to be, uh, I want to be an attractive place for businesses. And we have some great international companies within our city, Boston Scientific, uh, Ken's Foods, Sepracor, SciTech, great multinational companies. And I want to make sure that with these upgrades that we're not going to, to push these companies out because the cost of doing business within our city is so high. Um, I think another thing that brought up, Susan brought up and, about being thick-skinned, I'm not sure which brought up about being thick-skinned, I'll never forget that someone that worked on my campaign, um, I was the first female mayor elected for our city, and um, on Inauguration Day, a friend of mine gave me a box, and I opened it up, and inside was an armadillo. <laughs> and that armadillo sits on my desk, and it's my, you know, when I'm having a bad day, I look at it and say, you have to keep the thick skin. Well, when I ran and was re-elected last fall, Inauguration Day, same friend and his wife gave me a box, opened it up, and there inside was an armadillo pin. So I, have, I, I now have my armadillo pin, but it's a wonderful job. It's something that um, I wouldn't trade places with anybody for anything in the world. I absolutely love my job, and where else do you get to make a difference in someone's life every single day? And I say that to my department heads when we have meetings. I say that um, every week, every day, and it's one of the things I end my email. You have to remember that every decision you make will somehow affect someone's life. And whether it's a small thing where you have someone calling about their water bill, well, for that senior citizen and that $30 increase in that water bill is a difference between them buying a medication for paying their water bill. We have to remember that. So I think that, that we all sit here today, but we have an awesome responsibility. But I think I've gotten to know some new friends tonight, and some that I've known for a couple of years now, and I think we all can walk away and say, at the end of the day, we've made a difference and we love what we do. Um, some days, as Jeanette said, are not great, but we make a difference. And we really, I'm proud to be sitting here with this community. Thank you. In, in just reflecting on uh, the list of issues, I'm compiling the list still. I was inaugurated on January 1st this, of this year. and. If I could summarize, I find myself, I would characterize the job as, as, in, as having three components. One is a risk manager that really in the climate, the fiscal climate that we're living in, we're uh, making decisions about you know, what fire station stays open, what fire station stays closed, um, what potholes are we going to fill, what potholes are we not going to fill. We're going to fill them all, but maybe one is going to have to wait three days and because uh, we're not going to send the crews out on overtime because of the financial situation of the city. So constantly evaluating the risks that we face because uh, the city is responsible for the public service, for the drinking water, for the waste disposal of the, um, you know, the, the sewage. We, we have a lot of responsibility that impacts the quality of life of the, um, the people who live in our cities and towns. So risk manager is, is number one. Number two is um, change agent. When, when I became the mayor, it, it was very clear that Gloucester wanted change. But, but then when you go to do it, <laughs> you know, all hell breaks loose. 
and it's very, it's been a very interesting time. Um, so you have I we what I have to stay focused on is my core message, the um, the need for reform, and that the status quo just isn't going to cut it anymore. Um, and and it's it's hard. I I'm swimming in shark infested waters. <laughs> Um, and you know, you just have to put your head down and say, how's, how's that other way working for you, Gloucester? Um, because in our city, we do have a lot of issues. And then the third thing is, um, as an advocate, not only for the constituents, but also for my city or the region, um, the Harvard cover, I love that, the age of the mayors, because in the Boston Globe magazine, I think a week or so ago, there was a column that said, do, do mayors really matter? And they were talking about Menino and then spilled on to the other mayors. And, and I wrote a, a, a letter back saying, mayors matter. Because we are on the front lines. We are the chief executive officers of our cities. We ha I have an $80 million budget. I've got hundreds of employees. And <clears throat> just a quick uh, story on the advocacy piece. When, when we have a public hearing on our budget, you know, 700 people show up and they stand at the microphone and they tell us what they think about, you know, the funding. Are we going to fund the library? Are we going to cut teachers, et cetera? So when Senator Kerry came to visit me, I said, I'm going to come to Congress and I'm going to testify on the federal budget. And I told Congressman Tierney this and Senator Kennedy. So Congressman Tierney's office called me and he said, um, Mayor, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, American Idol can audition hundreds of thousands, and you can't see one mayor. To, uh, so, but there, and the thing was that the the feds only talk to the feds, <laughs> and and we are on the cutting edge of of formulating po um, policy. And, and, and the argument that I make is that the experience of the resident in this country is through the city or town they live in. It's where your education is performed, it's where the drinking water is, it's where the sewage treatment is, all the basic necessities. It's right here in the cities and towns. Um, so I think I've taken on sort of that role as an advocate for, for not only my city, but for, for others as well, and trying to enact reforms as, as a change agent and um, just managing the risks that we face in, in our fiscal climate. Hi, I'm Kim Driscoll from Salem. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I do want to thank you, Mass Boston and the Women for Center in Pub Politics and Public Policy for putting this on. It's not um, usual that we're all um, here just because we're women. We may be at mayor's events, but we're not here for that purpose, so it's a pleasure to share the stage with some very accomplished people. Um, I agree with everything that everyone said. Um, the, the interesting thing about being mayor, and I'm in my first term but third year, is that you're dealing with things at both the macro and the micro level. Um, so you have to deal with the issues today, but you also need to plan for the future. Um, I think most of what we do, or hopefully what we're doing, can be very boring. It's not the sexy stuff. Um, budget prep. We're all in budget prep mode right now. Um, rather than armadillo, they should have given us a box of Kleenex the way <laughs> budgets are going this year. But um, That's why you know, we all came. We wanted to get away from our budgets. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody wants to look at those numbers anymore. But capital planning and operational budgets and dealing with that stuff, it's not that sexy, but it really needs to get done. Um, those finance issues, operational matters. We deal with everything at this local level, and particularly at the mayor's office, from trash pickup to multi-million dollar school projects. And you, you definitely never know what's gonna happen. I love that Channel 25 was in. I'm glad they're chasing somebody else. Um, <laughs> but I think you really, one of, the, one of the joys of the job, frankly, is that every day is different, and you cannot be an expert in being mayor. I had the pleasure of working in municipal government. I was a corporate counsel for the city of Chelsea, worked there when they came out of receivership, and every day is different. I don't care if you're the mayor of Hoboken, New Jersey, um, Boston, or Salem. You plan your day, you think you've got it all good, and then something's gonna happen, and um, you know things change. Um, the public policy is critical. I agree, certainly at the local level, when something goes wrong locally, people come down to City Hall. Your trash does not get picked up. You're unhappy with something that's going on in your children's school. You're not, uh, you're not liking the way the park next door to you is being maintained. You are calling, you are writing, you are emailing. Um, you don't do that at the state level. When's the last time somebody actually wrote their state legislator? 
or their congressman, besides Carolyn. Um, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen that often. But you pick up the phone when you're unhappy about something within the community in which you live in. That's why it's a joy to do this job. I think many of us signed up for this because we weren't happy with what was happening in our community and we thought we could do a better job. That's certainly the reason I ran. I know some of you and I think that's why we do it. And it's a pleasure to do it. But from finance matters to operational matters and to those public policy priorities, because there's never enough resources to go along. So you're juggling a lot of balls and then trying to set priorities for your community and also plan for the future. Um, I think that's what makes it challenging. I think that's what makes it fun. Um, and and um, it's something that I'm sure we'll talk more about later in the, in the evening. Mayor Higgins. Hi, everybody. Uh, Claire Higgins from the city of Northampton. I win the uh, traveled the furthest. And, uh, um, you always win. And I, and I always win that award. Um, <laughs> except when, well, actually, there was a woman, Mayor Pittsfield. She would, would have won the award, but she lost. <laughs> um, and I want to make that, I say that because I want to make a point, you know, uh, we talk about the legislature and how many women in the legislature, there's not enough women in the legislature. But once you're in, you're in. People don't ever, um, you can, I was racking my brain today trying to think of about a, an incumbent legislator that lost. Women run for mayor and women win and then they can lose too because when you're the mayor, you're making decisions and those decisions affect people's day to day life as my colleagues have talked about. I've been mayor in the city of Northampton for four terms. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going into my fifth term now. And, um, you know, I, I talk about my with my therapist about that quite a bit. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it really is a great job. It's one of the best jobs, I, and I think we all agree. It's an it's a, uh, exhilarating job. And, and the reason, the thing that I really like is that you are always learning something. You're, there's always something that you're going to learn. I, I, you don't know enough whether you're there for 41 days or, or, or eight years, there's still things that I'm learning. First, day, first week I was in office, um, I got a call from my DPW director that e, e, the DEP wanted to meet with us about water, our, our water, and that we need to build a treatment center, and I needed to be able to talk coherently about HAAs and THMs. So I crammed on the way into the meeting and was, knew just enough to understand that it was going to cost me between 18 and 24 million dollars. <laughs> so th that's the, I mean, but we're constantly learning about things and constantly having to, to, to master uh, things. So in the first, I was a lot more confident in my first two years. And then in my second term, I really knew what I didn't know. And now I'm learning again, you know. So the thing, the issues that I've spent a lot of time on are, uh, the things I went in thinking I could spend time on and the things that I ended up spending time on are somewhat different. I came in with a passion for housing, for issues that affected uh, low and moderate income people. I had spent my working, adult working life in child care centers, so I cared about those issues very passionately. But I ended up working on things like the landfill and the water treatment center and all those other things, and then I've had to put those issues that I really care about, the housing issues and, and those other issues, around the edges. We've still made a lot of progress on those issues, but they're not the thing that I can spend my whole day on because of the pressing day-to-day -day stuff around water and sewer and fire protection and police protection. And then we're all, I think, passionate about education in some way or another, because it's the biggest thing we spend our money on. And, but it's the thing that is the highest pressure because there's not enough money to do the things that we need to do. And um, we're at the tail end, uh, at, at the local level, trying to make what, what state and federal authorities think should happen, happen, without enough resources. and. Uh, with changing kind of goals. So, uh, you know, that I spent a lot of time, therefore, during my terms in office on the state level, advocating for a change in how we approach some of these questions. So, I, I'm this is really great, I think, for all of us to have this opportunity to hear from each other, because we don't really get to do that that often. All and right. thank you for the opportunity. And, um, I want to talk a little bit, you know, I'm sure most of us in this room, anyway, are, have been following the presidential race. and. Hillary Clinton, of course, is uh, often asked about being a woman, and how, is, how does that affect her as she campaigns? Does she have to, you know, she worries about being too tough, she worries about being too motherly, she, you know, there's, it's such a fine line to walk, and I think of, you know, you guys, people like you all the time who have to run like, you know, I don't, and some, so I've had some people say, oh, I just, I'm, I am who I am, and if they like it, great, and if they don't, they won't vote for me. How, I want some honesty here. Um, what, and I want to start with you, Mayor Kay. You, you said being running as a, as a woman can be tough, and being a woman in, you know, in elected office. What, what did you mean by that? Give me an example. Or. 
actually really not on a local level, more so on a state and federal level, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think women who try to come across aggressively as men do, it never seems to work out that well. And she's too domineering, and you always take on all the terms. <clears throat> and yet if you're too passive or feminine, oh, she'll never cut it as a, as a uh, representative, or she'll never cut it as a uh, president. So also, women are tough on women. I have found that out. Not all women, but it's tough to get the female vote. I, I was astonished when you really start looking into the demographics and who votes for who. Women expect certain things of women in running for office. Um, they're, they're very, very critical. So I think we have, to, we have to give some more support to women who are running for higher office. Uh, cut them a break. We look at the credentials, look at the experience, what they can do, and that's very important, and I hope the students will take that, take that message and share it. I certainly like to. Mentoring is critical, but Hillary has got a tough road. I, the numbers might be close. I will tell you that I would love to see a woman president. I just think it's going to be extremely difficult. I don't know if we're ready yet. You know, it also uh, depends on where you start. When I, I started on the ward committee level, piece of cake, put your name, you put your name on the ballot, they just, they check a box, you get it elected. School committee, not so hard. City council, then I wanted to do the man's job. A and that's when I, you know, people would come to me and say, well, why don't you stay on school committee? You're a mother, you take care of people. And, and I would, for, first of all, I said, well, there's a vacancy, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm running against anybody. <laughs> Um, and I think I can do as good a job and, you know, I don't see you saying, well, there's too many guys or there's too many of any, you know, so it really, it almost got personal with people. We got into arguments. As long as I was the ward on the, doing the ward politics, that was fine. That was very easy. School committee, that was perfect, you know, teaching, kids, motherly, nurturing. But when I decided this, I wanted to go to the city council, I, that's when I got the most problems, the most trouble. And then, because it was one other uh, person of color, I was, it was thought that, well, if you run, you'll knock that person out. Forgetting the fact that there were two vacancies, so I just thought that was, it was very interesting how <laughs> the whole conversation changed when I wanted to move to a higher office. And I, I would wonder, did you have, I don't know if any of you, I, when I looked at the uh, statistics, it said some of you served on school committee, and did you have the same experience when you wanted to move from one office to the other? I was looking at the list also, and I was um, surprised to see that six of us had started, uh, six of the female mayors had started on school committee. And I think that that kind of goes back to our passion, our commitment to our children, and things like that. But I find, I found the same thing. Um, right now, I think Marlboro's, a, uh, our statistics are probably a little bit better than some of the other cities. Right now on our school committee, we have five women and two men. Um, what I find interesting is the fourth floor of City Hall, where my office is in the legal office, um, we're all women except for one man up there, and we moved him down the mezzanine, uh, <laughs> down a couple of steps and into that other office. And the entire fourth floor, my entire uh, legal department and my, my staff are all women. And it is great. And people come up and say to us, you know, we never heard laughter before. I think it's a difference with women in terms of we can get the job done, but we also, we want to enjoy what we do every day. Um, there's nothing to stop us from, from laughing and joking and and my aide, my chief of staff, is, uh, is fantastic. In her office, she doesn't get up. She just yells in the other room. <laughs> and we yell back and forth. And, and it's, we look at each other at the end of the day and say, we got a lot done, but we really had a good time. Um, I was joking earlier when, uh, Allison, you asked what the difference was um, running as a woman. And I jokingly said to some of my colleagues when I got here, I said, the difference was if it was a man heading down here tonight, he wouldn't have had to stop as I did at Macy's to get new pantyhose because he got to <laughs> run on the way. Um, but it, I mean, it, it's a joke, but it's, we have the little things. We, um, I know in the article today that, uh, in the Globe that was highlighting tonight that Kim was talking about the fact that we run home and make dinner for the kids, get them ready for bed, and then run back out to a council meeting. And it, it really is different because I think innately we want to make sure that our family's taken care of and the balancing act, for me, that has always been a very difficult thing. Um, and I know some of us have children in school systems in which we have uh, within our cities and, and that's always hard. Um, you know, my son always gets upset seeing his mom in school. Like, 
Rockefeller exists. We don't, we don't <laughs> acknowledge that she's there. But I think you go back to, you know, as women, we, we find, I think we are more collaborative. Uh, at least that's what I found talking to my colleagues, is that um, I know my predecessor, even with putting together our capital budget, it was always present the capital budget to the mayor, the mayor decides what capital projects, and that's what got submitted. Uh, I have a capital team of 12 people, and we sit down, and I'm just one vote on that 12. And we got our capital plan through almost in its entirety the last time. We've got another one before the council now. And it's because we work together as a team. I don't believe that I know everything. I don't know everything about fire safety, police, um, or DPW issues. And I admit that. So I surround myself with people that, that can help. And I, it's the thing with guys asking for directions. But they'll never stop and ask for directions. We'll ask for help. I, I freely admit that I don't know um, uh, about the issues, some of the major issues. I don't know the technical aspects. And I'm not afraid to ask. Um, yeah, I, just, I followed a woman mayor. So Mary Ford was the mayor of Northampton for eight years before, before I was the mayor. So now the city's had 16 years worth of women mayors. That means that 16 graduating classes have had their diplomas handed them to them by a, a woman, which I think is a very powerful statement for those kids. And I've told this anecdote before, so some of you may have heard it, but um, a woman showed up in my office with her son, and she said, um, I, I needed to bring him to see you because we were at the store, and he said to me, Mom, can men be mayors? <laughs> so I, I told him no. No, I, <laughs> I, I told him, of course they could, in other cities besides my family. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that... So there's a level of acceptance there in a way that is, is, is great. But, you know, I get, I've gotten calls, hang up uh, a calls where people leave me an anonymous message telling me they didn't like what I wore, I need to do something about my hair, um, anonymous postings about my appearance. And I'm going to fully admit that I am fashion impaired, okay? <laughs> I, I uh, worked in childcare for 25 years, for God's sake. I wasn't dressing up to go to work, so I need help. But I don't, but, but there's a level where people feel okay with criticizing women in the public eye that they would never do with men. They just never would do that. And uh, I'm curious to know, did any of you women um, run against a man in your yeah, last election? Yeah, Raise yeah. your hands. Did, <laughs> wow, that's, that's interesting. Um, was running different? I mean, were, were, did you feel, and Mayor Higgins, maybe you can touch on that. I've run not. against a man every time I've had an opponent. I've every never single time, race. okay. And I've had an opponent three out of the four races. And do they, do you feel that's used for or against you in any way? I mean, I, there have been, uh, there ha it has been used, um, it, it's been very thinly, it's been veiled in such a way that it's hard to even put a, put a finger on it. But mm -hmm. sort of time for a change is used in a way that it, it says more than what, it, what they're trying to say. Hmm. I mean. You know, and there are, there's a, 35% uh, of the people in the city of Northampton are not going to vote for me, okay? Bozo the Clown could run and they will vote for him. In fact, I think they did in the last election. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They're going to vote for the op opponent, and some of that is because I'm a woman. Mayor Driscoll, what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, I, uh, I think for those of us who were the first woman mayors, the experience is, is a little bit different just because we were the first one. Uh, in my race, I ran against an incumbent who was the male and a longtime city councilor, two sort of establishment candidates. And there was this huge women issue. I mean, we called it the W factor. We had a name for it in the campaign. And, um, you know, we wrestled with it because we heard, now, although if you compared resumes, if we did the blind poll, here's the resumes of the three people who are running for mayor, it probably would have been an easy choice. I had a lot of municipal experience. I was a municipal lawyer. I had uh, operational experience. I had been on the city council for two terms. And, and, and certainly, if you just looked at the resumes and compared who's probably the most qualified, um, it would have been, I would have thought it would be an easy choice. It's a beauty contest, though, when you're running for mayor. It's a popularity contest. And you've got folks who are entrenched, who grew up in the community in Salem. I didn't grow up in Salem, so I didn't grow up there. I'm not that well known. Um, I didn't have any money. And the W factor. That is very, very difficult to overcome, particularly for the first woman candidate. And I, we heard all the time, we like Kim. Yes, yeah, she's smart. Yes, yeah, she should stay on the council, you know? Um, she'd be great there. Salem's not ready for a woman. Salem's not ready for a woman. All the time, there would have been a woman candidate who was fairly well known who ran for state rep the year before and had lost. So this was trumped up. There were very well-meaning, good-intentioned people in town who bought into that. 
who completely bought into that, that we're just not ready for women. Some women, um, I had young children, I had a three-year-old at the time of the campaign, who's gonna take care of the babies? You know, those comments were made. So there were a lot of that factor in the race. I think it all went away when we topped the ticket in the primary. That was a good thing. And people began to say, oh, wait a minute, you, you can win. And I, I really believe the next person who runs a woman candidate, it will be a non-factor or a very small factor because it just took one person to do it, especially one who wasn't well known, didn't have any money, um, and, and sort of you know, beat the conventional wisdom. But um, I do think it was an uphill battle. And there's nothing you can do about it, by the way. Veterans in my campaign, you know, the W factor, what are we going to do about it? Hey, guess what? I'm a woman. That's not changing, you know? So, it, you know, do you confront it is what you do. And we talked about qualifications and professionals and having that, and I think it, it worked out well. So my first election, I, ran, I won by 70%. My second election, two years, be, I have a four-year term, and I'm in my second term. I had a two-year letter-writing campaign, anonymous, citywide, on every issue, accusing me of everything from sliced bread to, oh, unbelievable. And I won by 82%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And see, what I've learned, I, uh, you know, I was a lawyer for a long time, and the reason why I ran for mayor, I never wanted to be mayor. Never aspired to be mayor. I was a biology major, but I didn't like what was happening in the city, and people kept saying, you have to run, you can change it, you can, and being shy, not now am I shy after being mayor, but um, you realize that you get tough and you get determined, but the most important thing you do, I used to have in front of me, PF, always at every debate, at every time, my uncle put that in front of me, and that meant poised and focused. And if you, if people are not stupid, whether it be in the United States races or not. If you do the job and you're honest with people, they'll see through that. But most importantly, you have to be yourself and say what you're gonna do as mayor. And I never in my life, I lost my job, that's why I ran for mayor. I was fired. <laughs> okay. Poised and focused. Do, poised and focused. <laughs> for doing my job. And you know something? The only thing I say to every young person that comes in my office, whether they be boy or girl, that seat belongs to you. And you can be mayor someday, too. Um, I'm the first popularly elected female in Gloucester, and I ran um, against a, an entrenched sort of establishment candidate, a male who was the president of the city council. But I had served on the school committee, and there was, um, for four years, and there was some bullying from other members of the committee. And I think the, from a gender um, perspective, what would happen was, um, I was kind of the, the, um, activist mom who ran for school committee and won, and I had two children in the school, and I was going to set the world on fire. And boy, the, some of the members on that school committee just wanted nothing to do with that, and they really tried to bully me. And two things happened. One was I would just sit back, and the people in the audience would say, who is that poor woman up there? because the man would look like such a jerk for <laughs> bullying the woman. So you learn how to kind of use <clears throat> your gender to your advantage. And I, learned, I actually learned that in my business career, which was all management consulting and financial services, which is all male dominated. Um, so you use your gender to your advantage without um, saying I'm a woman, therefore, you know, it's much more subtle than that. But the second thing that happened is it forced me to learn procedure. My, I, what are the levers? How do I use parliamentary procedure in the school committee to get done what I need done? Because when I, when I see some of my women colleagues um, on the school committee, they kind of rant and rave, okay, where's the motion? <laughs> and you need a second, and then it needs to have a discussion and a vote. And so you really have to be um, scientific about the levers at your disposal to advance what you're trying to get done. And in the campaign, that served me very well. Um, there was some bullying that took place, and I, 
it just made the other candidate just look so bad, and they, they, there was there was no tolerance on the part of the public to to put up with kind of the negative campaigning, and it it, it backfired. And 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 I do think that that was a gender thing because it comes across so much more harshly. And I never struck back. Um, I was fierce and focused in debates, but I never you know, went negative, I never went on the personal attacks, because coming from a woman, the negative attacks are just disastrous. You know, you just, a woman just can't pull it off, I think. I think men to men can, but in a man coming to a woman is very unappealing, but a woman attacking a man, forget it. You must watch the debates with a whole different <laughs> eye, all of you, oh, than we do, because you've been there. and. Um, yeah. Mayor Simmons, jump in here and bring the mic right over. Yeah. Just, just very briefly, I did raise my hand when you asked that I have a male opponent because in Cambridge, you know, Cambridge is that very strange city across the water. <laughs> uh, we have what we call PR elections, which is proportional representation. And so there were 16 candidates, uh, 19 candidates in the race, all running citywide. 13 were men, three were women incumbents. You, you run for city council and then the city council elects the mayor. So I just wanted to explain that. So in, in Cambridge, you, you'll, until we change the charter, oh, you don't run for mayor. You actually run for city council. I just wanted to Well, while that. we've got you, Mayor, since you're the only mayor of color right now on the panel here, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, Massachusetts, the you know, diversity in our cities and towns is growing, and I'm wondering how that has affected you um, in terms of getting elected or now that you're mm -hmm. in office. Getting a, when I ran um, for office, and as I always, you play to your strengths. So I'm a woman, I'm a person of color. You use that to, to help yourself get elected. You look for your affinity group. And Cambridge is an extremely diverse city, so it, it's, it's a good place to be and to live. And so for, for me, am I going to say, is race not a factor? Race is a factor still today. I, I, if you're not a person of color, you may not see it when it happens, but I know the difference when I sit in a room and I could be with a colleague and someone is speaking to us, but they speak more to the man, the white man, than they do to me and I'm the mayor. And I you know, excuse me, if you want something done, you gotta talk to me. <laughs> you know, and, which is, and, and, and because of that, and because of the work that I've done, and because I believe, there's a, a quote I love to use by uh, Anna Julia Cooper, she said it back in the 18, AIDS, it says, only the black woman can say when and where I enter without suing, without uh, patronage, the whole race enters with me. And so for being a mayor of color, being a black woman, the whole race enters with me. So all those groups that I identify, I hope that my presence in the work that I do makes a difference for them. But it is often a very lonely place, I will tell you. There are not any other w black women mayors in Massachusetts. Are you the first I'm the woman? First. Wow. And, and so, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm actually going to put a charge to Carol. So you have to write the playbook, <laughs> so that we all, with a chapter about all of us, if, because we, although we're all women, we have different things that affect our lives. You know, if you're a person of color or, or where, however you get there, you know, there was there was no reference uh, point for me, and so. Uh, you sort of learn by doing. It's really on-the-job training. You know, if anyone else would like to weigh in on diversity, I'd li we only have a limited time left, but uh, that, feel free to chime in. And also, I, you know, people always, I love this, I always love to hear how people got where they got, and sometimes it's completely, you know, not what you expected. Yeah, so. I just want to mention I, one please. thing. I've been, I've been out as a lesbian in the city of Northampton for many years when I was on the city council. That actually was a subcurrent that was there when I, when I run almost every time, too. And, um, and that has given people permission to criticize me in a, in a different way. You know, I always say there's not really a gay way to run a parking system. You know, <laughs> you know we'll have purple meters for the gay people. <laughs> so, you know, so that's come up. You know, and, 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 and I like what Denise said to play to your strengths. City of Northampton has a large and vibrant lesbian community. Certainly helped me. Um, and, uh, but I think as time has gone on, it's less and less and less of an issue. And, um, and, you know, and I know that uh, there have been, uh, since then, been other people who are out who have run for city council or other offices, and it hasn't Absolutely. been a big deal. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Can I just pick up on one point there, because yeah, I think please. it's important. Claire's been in office um, a good bit now, and is very well respected, not only by the women colleagues here, but across the state by male colleagues. And I think it speaks to the fact that 
Um, we need to do this right. I always feel like I'm the first woman mayor in Salem. I can't mess it up because it's going to be a heck of a lot harder for the person behind me. Absolutely. I brought my 10-year-old daughter here, and the reason I brought her here today was obviously lots of good reasons, but um, <laughs> one of the key one is sometimes you have to make sacrifices, and I think to be mayor, we all have to make sacrifices, and sometimes that's family. And to be the first one, we've got to do it even more so. We've got to put in the extra hours. You've got to do the extra time because we can't mess it up. It'll, the person behind us will pay the price. The next woman mayor, they'll remember it, especially the first. I think there's just this little, I can't say it drives every decision you make, but it's there. It's hanging around. And um, I think it's important for folks to realize that. Um, with the responsibility comes certainly an opportunity to get it done right. And uh, there are folks that end up not seeing us at home as much. And so it's good for them to spend time with their mom one-on-one -on -one when they can at events like this. Yeah. Kim, Kim brings up a good point um, when you talk about being the first. Um, when I ran, people said, you know, what, how do you feel about possibly being the first female mayor? And my response always was, it doesn't matter to me that I'm the first female mayor. I just want to be a good mayor. And it doesn't matter. And I, I guess I didn't realize the impact that I had um, being the first female mayor. I think it really hit me when I won when my daughter, who I brought my, Kim and I, I think are separated at birth because we, <laughs> our stories are so similar in terms of running against incumbents, where we've come from and everything. I brought my daughter who's a sophomore in college and she was in high school at the time. And I didn't realize the impact of what I had accomplished until the night of election night and the weeks afterwards where she and her friends, it was the excitement that look what my mom did and look what I can do. And it never, it didn't hit me through the whole campaign about the whole issue about being the first female mayor. But, but once I did and I realized at home what a difference it made for my own daughter to say, you really can do anything you want to do. And it doesn't matter whether, you, you know, whether you're the first one to do it and break that ground. But I think Kim made a good point that we, we have, as the first female mayors, um, made ourselves kind of the poster child. And those who follow after us will have I think an easier time because we broke that barrier. For me, my city council, uh, it was an old boys club. Um, it was, I was only the third female that had ever, fourth female that ever served over the whole um, history of the city. And it really was, I ran against an, a gentleman who had been, uh, was mayor for one term, he was an incumbent, had served on the city council for 18 years. It was just the old boys network. He was gonna be there as long as he wanted to be there. And I sat as chair of the finance committee on the council and said, I don't like what's happening. And either I run for mayor or I don't run for council again because I don't like what's going on. And I said to my sister, I said that to my sister. My sister said, so why aren't you going to run for mayor? And I said, well, I can't do that. And she said, well, why not? And I looked at her and said, I really don't have a good reason why I, I can't. <laughs> um, so I did. And I, I remember I pulled papers the last day. I had no money. I had um, $89 <laughs> in my campaign account. It was the last day in August, um, August 4th that I pulled papers, the last day you could pull them. I had five days to turn them around. I had, um, again, no money. And <laughs> we had a primary that was gonna happen in September. So I had six weeks to figure out how I was gonna get people to know who I was. And I started at grassroots, we did coffees. We did the cheap way. I had the cheapest, the year I won my first term, in the whole state, I ha had the return, the cheapest per vote expenditure. And I'm proud of that. And uh, I really am. I mean, we, we did it on a shoestring. We, I, seriously, we baked cookies to hand out at the senior center because we had no money. We did everything we could, but it, it was trying to be creative and start out at the last minute and say, it doesn't matter whether we have money, whether we're a woman. We're the best qualified person to run that city. And we've all proven we are. Mm. Mayor it, Kay, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm also wondering, I, I want to just, maybe I'll just start with you. What were you, do, what was your life before becoming mayor? Normal. <laughs> yeah, really, and it's only been a couple of months. How, how did you get up, how did you get your position? How did you I, I originally started, um, I was a soccer mom, and I moved into the town and got um, affiliated with a local soccer group. There were 2,000 children playing, lots of parents, and that's how I got to know everyone in the town. That became the base. Believe it or not, people mo know me more, even today, from being part of that soccer group than as mayor. It's true, people stop me all the time. I know you. They think, oh yeah, I'm the mayor. They say, no, no, I remember you on the soccer field. 
So I coached and I refereed and then I got on the board of directors and just left. And in fact, I stayed on there for about 26 years and again, that was my base. I worked at a local newspaper and we printed the warrant for the town meeting. I was fascinated. I had come out of a city, I grew up in South Boston. I came out of a city form of government and this was close, this was neat. It was democratic, it was close to the people. I wanted to get involved in this. I got appointed to the finance committee. Finance committee is a tough group of people. I will tell you that it was almost unanimously male. I think there was one other female with me. I was told by the chairperson to not raise my hand, don't ask a question, sit there for one year and learn. I don't know if the men were told that, but I was told that. <laughs> well, about, after about a month, I couldn't take any more of it, so I went to the chairman and I said, I'll mow your lawn for two months if you teach me municipal finance. He said, he would scratched his head, he was an old coot, and he said, <laughs> he was a, a partner of Grant Thornton, so I knew he, would, he, he was the person to get the information from. I mowed his lawn two weeks in a row, he felt bad for me, and we became fast friends. <laughs> so that's, that was the, where I learned everything about municipal government. A real government. conventional it's, track you took. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> And uh, you don't learn any other place than on a finance committee because you, you see the management of all departments, you see what, what their spending patterns are. That was a big plus for me. I ran for selectman in one, served three terms, ran for mayor, the first mayor, lost to the fire chief. And um, his first, he was in two terms. I ran two years later as town councilor, one, served three terms. I must tell you that my, term, my time on council was a great benefit for me. I did not have a lot of bad experiences. I think I was the mother. There were some young men and I would straighten their ties and stuff so they thought I was pretty cool. Um, and my experience in uh, finance, I would help them out when, when they needed it. I will tell you though, I, uh, and then I ran for mayor this time and, and during the preliminary, I uh, had very good figures. And it's very interesting because my campaign, uh, people are, were kind of worried about me being a, a woman, and they said, you know, we're hearing some things in the neighborhood, but they're not sure if they're gonna vote for you. I said, look, all we can do is try, I'm gonna get out there, we'll get into debates, and then there was YouTube. What in the <laughs> heck? I, had, I got a call from somebody out of state, and they said, so we saw you on YouTube, it was a debate. I said, what is YouTube? <laughs> I had never seen this thing before. Well, every debate was on YouTube. Uh, my, I, had got, uh, I had an interview, and um, was recommended by the, the uh, local daily newspaper, all on YouTube. And thank God, my opponent was not a good debater. He was arrogant, and he tried to get me uh, sort of angry, and um, I didn't, I was a great victim. Uh, there is a sense of fair play out there, I will tell you. The voters have that. And if you can be a great victim, sit back, suck it up, take it, and then move on and just tell them what, you, what you're really all about, and that works. I will tell you that YouTube helped me immensely. But things are changing, and just a very quick story. I had a group of brownies come up to my office. They wanted to tour the mayor's office and thought that was pretty cool. And one little girl came aside and she said to me, who are all those boys that you hire? She met the town council. They were all men. That I was on. And I said, well, that's the town council. I don't hire them, they get elected. And she said, I don't care, they're all boys. How come there aren't any girls on there? I said, well, you know, they have to be elected, but you can be on the town council when you grow up. She turned to me with an attitude and said, traitor. <laughs> so things are changing. She wanted me to make sure there were women on that council, and I think things are changing with our young people, and uh, we'll see a big difference, I'm sure. No, I, I absolutely. I do want to get to the Q&A because we want to allow plenty of time for that. Does that I want to let anyone else chime in just for a second who, wanted, on that. I just want to say in terms of background, I, I mean, I grew up in a family where it was very political. People talked about politics. And I think you have to have some of that, that you had some interest beforehand. You know, my father expected his girls to make a difference in the world. And so I think that makes a difference. But I worked in a traditionally women's um, workplace. I worked in a child care center. I took care of kids for 25 years. And, and so that's not typically where you, 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 then you come into managing a $71 million budget from working in a child care center. I was the director at, at the time that I left. But, but you know something, all those, those skills that I learned running a daycare center, I jokingly say is the best <coughs> training for running a city, but it, but it actually is true. And we, we don't, we, we look at the sort of the inventory of workplace skills and think that's what you need. But actually those skills of uh, mediating, conciliation, um, solving problems, being ready in a crisis, all those kinds of things that I had to have, have at the ready when I ran a daycare center or when I was working in that role have, have actually served me extraordinarily well 
in, in the role as mayor. And the, the thing that's absolutely the, the same in a mayor's job or running a daycare center is no day is the same. So you can't go in with a plan and think that that's the plan you're gonna execute. So that kind of nimble thinking I learned on the job in the previous job I had. And, and sometimes I think women think, well, I didn't have the kind of job that prepared me to do this kind of work. You know, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be a whatever. You don't. The skills that people use every day, raising their kids or taking care of kids or all the kinds of jobs that women often end up at doing are the kinds of skills that I end up using all the time educating people about what's in the budget, breaking down uh, the information that's very complex on, about local government into manageable sizes so people can understand it. Those are the kind of skills that women have. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that served me very well moving into this role. I, I just wanted to say very quickly, it, it's all about having a driving purpose. I'm, you know, I often say I'm old enough to have made history but still young enough to make history and I grew up part of my life, uh, <coughs> most of my life in the, in the North but a short, period of my time, I grew up in the South, and I remember very vivid, vividly going to a funeral in the South. We stopped at a filling station, and I went to the restroom, so I go into the front of the, the, get, the filling station, I asked the gentleman for the restroom key, because the bathroom door was locked, and he says, oh, just go around the back, and I walked around the back, and there was a sign saying colored. It was the worst facility you could imagine. Going outside was a, an upgrade, and I remember going to my grandmother and saying, I'm not going to go in there. And she grabbed me by my collar and says, you will get us killed. And I remember from that day forward, I said, I will not be told no. Yeah. And, and that just sort of set the stage for me. Every job I had, I won't be told what I can't do. So when it was you know, running for the school committee, should you or should you not, I won't be told what I can't do. And when it came to the city council, I won't be told what I can't do. And I felt that I had to, to push myself, grit and determination, to, to obtain the, these, these offices. Because if I did it, someone would look at me and say, I can do it too. Mm. A great story. Uh, <clears throat> Before we move on to the Q&A, I have one question I want all of you to answer, although I'm not expecting too much honesty from this one, but how many of you aspire to higher office? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know what's interesting about mayors? They don't tend to go to higher office. That's, well, that's as why a, I asked. As, I a, as a practical matter, it's the rare mayor that manages to get out and go to the next office. I can think of a few. Mike Capuano's one. But it's really a ticket, you know, to Do any uh, of you think of that with life know, after being the mayor and what, you know, I, I think that's tough for, uh, tough for a lot of people when after they've been mayor. What is the next thing that they're going to do? And, uh, uh, you know, I postpone that, that thinking a lot. But um, in terms of aspiring to higher office, I think it's a very difficult position to run from because you have to make decisions. Every day you're upsetting somebody with, you know, you're saying no to someone, and that makes it very difficult to run for mayor, for a higher position after you've been a mayor. You know, I just had the opportunity, my uh, state rep, Steve LaDuke resigned uh, a couple of weeks ago, and our state senator is um, not running for re-election. So I had been pushed and pushed and pushed and announced last week that I wasn't going to run for either position. And um, some people accepted it, and other people said, well, why wouldn't you want to run for something? And I said, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I truly love what I do. And um, it was kind of surprising, the, the response that I got, that, you know, with being the only city that's in, in the, um, both the representative's district and in the Senate district, it was, we want to keep that seat within our you city. You probably would have had a good shot at and it, too. And, that's, <laughs> and, and at this point, that's what people had said. You know, you're the only one that we can put up that, w that we know, you know, can win this seat and keep it within the city. And I, I thought about it for a couple of weeks. I seriously thought about it, talked to the people that are close to me, and, and decided that I really, truly love what I do on a daily yeah. basis, and I couldn't imagine leaving and doing something else. So I think Claire's right in terms of aspiring to higher office. I think you get entrenched in what you do every day and making that difference. That I, I just don't know that you can do that in another office. Yeah, Mayor McCarthy. First of all, if I had a rest, a real rest, I would think about it. Um, I do believe in term limits, self-imposed. I have basically made it known that I will only run for two terms. You know, that's a danger because you declare yourself to be a lame duck, but it's also an honesty. Um, but if I had a rest, I do like politics and I do like public service, so I'm kind of young. What would I do? And it's natural to me that I like politics, so I can't say that I wouldn't. Hmm. But I don't know what, though. 
Mm. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> You'll have time to think about it. Yes. I, I think it's opportunity and timing. Right. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it what presents itself at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. So that I've, I've thought about higher office, but if, would I run against an incumbent? Probably not. So it's really timing and opportunity. Okay, so wh whoever would like to ask a question, feel free to get up and get behind the mic there, and uh, don't be shy. <laughs> my husband said that I couldn't do it until my children were out of school because they didn't want to be embarrassed. Where are you from? Quincy. Quincy, yeah. So the thing that um, I'd like to point out as a parallel to your stories is that for me, being in business, it's the same parallel, the same statistics, same uh, war stories, etc. So I think if you did a study of women in the corporate corporate world, be it on the boards, CEOs, um, in sales, whatever, that you would have the same parallels in the stories. And I think in the 70s, when we were all trying to make our way, there was much more prevalent women in roles, but I think we just all pulled back because some of the BS just I don't know, I'm not sure. But the real question I have is probably to Carol in regards to the one thing that I think of a, a mayor or any politics is, I like the story that you were saying that you didn't use a lot of money. Because what I think is a challenge is that people do not know how to think outside the box. How can you come up with some other alternatives to get where you can go and still perform your functions because there'll never be enough money and there's going to be patronage, and there's going to be all different things that you have to take care of, but at the same point in time, you still want to meet your, the expectations you set for yourself. So how much can you really be a change agent in, in, in politics and get things done, especially if you're a business person? I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> because, I, truly, it's been two and a half months, and I think what... Um, what I have to stay focused on is I'm inside City Hall now, and there are a lot of um, insiders, a lot of entrenched thinking and personalities. And what I have to do is I have to get out to the neighborhoods. I have to get out to, in Gloucester we have five different neighborhoods, get out into the wards, have my own town meetings, connect with the voters and the people and the residents of the community and kind of make sure I don't um, fall prey to the sort of the inside city hall mentality where you think that that's the way the world is. And um, it, it, it isn't. And every time I go to a neighborhood meeting, I, I remind myself of why I'm in that office. And, and that's, I'm giving a state of the city report um, on my 100th day, which was one of my campaign promises, which is April 9th and I'm gonna deliver it throughout the city. I'm not gonna just do it in City Hall. I'm gonna deliver it throughout the city. And I write a weekly column, or a monthly column in the newspaper. I, I try to connect directly as much as I absolutely can. But it's hard. I, we, the staff that I have in my office is very, very slim. Um, we just don't have the resources to have PR, to have um, um, the outreach that's, that's necessary. And, some changes are going to go through and some aren't. It, coming out of the private sector, <clears throat> you know, you just did something because it was the right thing to do. <laughs> it's just not the case in, in government. <laughs> um, so if I get half the changes through that I want to get through, I'm going to be, I will have considered it a success. Okay, next question. Can I just pick up on oh, one thing that you please, said? Because I think yes. it's important. Something about, um, my husband wouldn't let me run that part. Um, I do think, all right, well, I, I just think it's an important thing to note that, at least for myself and whether it's, uh, you know, whoever your spouse is, it really does pay to have a supportive spouse at home. Um, I've, I had three young kids when we ran uh, at first, quit my job. I mean, those sorts of conversations, yeah, I'm gonna quit my job because we don't have any money so I can run full time and wear out the shoe leather. Um, that takes a really supportive environment. So, um, and there are plenty of husbands who would have said, uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, and having somebody at home to help out with all those issues, whatever field you're in, whether it's uh, private sector or the public sector, 
makes all the difference. There's no way I could be a successful mayor without having a husband, a willing partner, who you know cooks, uh, takes care of kids, helps with homework, does all the traditional things that um, folks used to think only his mother could do. And it's great to, to frankly have that in the home. And I'm sure others um, have that similar experience. Hi, uh, Deborah Quinn, Methuen City Councilor. I'm in my second term currently. Um, I wonder if you've had this experience. You're in a meeting or you're at the city council and you do your homework because you know you have to do your homework because you know that the eight guys on the council are going to rip everything you say apart. So as you're answering questions or asking questions, someone will lean over to you and say, who, who told you about that? Who told you to ask that question? Or how did you find out? I'm thinking that you know, every time you, you talk about public safety, who told you to ask that question? It just, it infuriated me the first two years that finally this year, every time I come up with something or ask a question before somebody says something, I say, this is the book, this is the author, this is the email address, these are the people I asked. It's almost like you can't come up with a concrete, uh, you know, evidence to say this is what I did. So in the two years, and I wonder, you, you probably have the same experiences, I came up with this thing called Focus on Females. It's basically a career-oriented program for juniors and seniors in Methuen. And we go to the high schools and we bring um, educated women in different backgrounds and we might bring a lawyer, a social worker, a judge and show the girls, look ladies, you know what, you might want to be a paralegal, but you can be a judge. And all these jobs are great. You might want to be a teacher, but how about a superintendent of schools? And show them that, you know what, you can't, you, there's other things besides child rearing. And you know what, I think men do, uh, women do a better job in the budget because we watch our pennies a little bit better than the guys do. But I think my question is, how do you get around that when every question you ask, they're saying, how did you get that answer? Who told you? Can you all, any of you relate to that? Well, I can certainly be, relate to it, but my attitude sometimes is, uh, I don't answer it. I'm, I don't gratify it with an answer. Uh, you know, I would hope that they would assume that you come informed and prepared. And so, I mean, everyone I'm sure might take a, a, have a different way of answering, but that's how I, I, I just don't take that challenge. I, I think I, you're identifying another problem, though, which is that I think women often aren't expected to, to be knowledgeable in the areas of public safety, public works, capital planning, those kinds of things. And you just have to be really knowledgeable and, and to move, just move forward um, and, and, do, and say what you need to say and do what you need to do. And, and after a while, people realize, oh boy, she really does know what she's talking about. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kinian. I'm a first time counselor from the city of Methuen, and I appreciate all the information you all gave today. And a couple of things I ran on, and I'd like to hear from some of the uh, mayors who are no first termers, like myself. What were some of the things, and maybe this would help the, um, the students from Boston um, over here, what were some of the issues that you ran on that you felt maybe put you in the forefront to win your election? I know mine was change and a more softer side of myself. What were some of the things that you brought to the table that allowed you to maybe 82% at some time, or um, as one of you said, you top the ticket, I think, in the primary. What were some of those things that you felt were your strengths during your campaign? I can speak to myself. We focused on professionalism, not politics. And uh, if, if we could make it a resume race, I felt very comfortable that we could win. If it was a beauty contest, I could be in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> Mayor McCoy, oh yeah, please, Mayor Kay. Yes, um, I, I focused on experience, um, it, what I could bring to the position. And again, b being the, um, having served as executive secretary for a nearby town, I had my name in the paper a lot from that position. And, and so that they could recognize that. So it was experience that I pushed heavily, and I believe that got me through. I focused on, in the primary, some of the differences on the issues. And after the primary, I focused on what I was going to do. And I knocked doors you know, throughout the city. I sent flyers that I believed to be informative, and they were simple. They were in different color, construction paper, but they had a message. And um, that's basically what I did. Thank you. 
please. Hi, my name is Casey Kelly. I'm a student in the program for Women in Politics and Public Policy here at UMass Boston. And um, thank you. You're such an inspiration, first of all. Um, as Dean Crosby and Dr. Ransford pointed out, we have seen really no change in women's um, success in um, politics as far as their representation uh, on the whole. Um, we know that when women run, they win. So one of the things that I'm interested in is figuring out how do we convince more women to run. And I'm interested to hear your perspective on what we can do and um, from your experience, um, maybe what would have helped you. Please. One of the things, um, one of the negative things we've gone back to, we talked a little bit about campaigns. I had made a choice, um, where did we come from? I I'd served on the city council before this and on the school committee before that. But before that, I made the conscious decision. I, I was, took 10 years to raise my children. And that was an issue that was brought up during the campaign. Um, one of those subtle things that Claire talks about, um, had talked about earlier, where um, my opponent sat there and just um, pounded the fact that while I was home taking care of my children, he had been out working um, as an executive as a company and all of this kind of stuff. And I, I personally took offense to that. Um, and I, I never let it show. But it bothered me that I made the decision to be home with my children and be active in my children's education. And that's what got me involved. You know, I was a PTO president and, and I was portrayed as, as the, um, the PTO mom and what does she know and how can she run a city? Um, yet people tend to forget that, yeah, I, I did the PTO and any of the moms out there who've done PTO, you know that that's a tough job. Um, ran for school committee, ran for city council, was finance chair. Um, did all of these things, but it went back to, well, what was I doing in those, you know, those 10 years that I had chosen to, to raise my children? Um, and I think, to me, when I, when I talk to people that are out there and I talk to young women, and, and again, the Girl Scouts come to talk to you and things like that, I always say that you, you know, people say you can't have everything. And I'm a perfect example, you can have everything. Kim's a perfect example of doing it at the same time. You can do it if you want to do it. And as long as you have the desire, the commitment, um, to do it, you can. And we can't ever say that a choice that you made, a previous choice, is going to preclude you from doing something that you want in the future. I wouldn't trade those years with my children for anything in the world. And to me, that was one of the most important things I do. Time and opportunity, I think we talked about it earlier, that time and opportunity, it was an opportunity for me and a time for me because my children were getting older for me to be able to do this. Um, but I think we need to stress that to, it's always you can't have everything as a woman. You can't be a mom and you can't have a full-time job and be out and do everything. You know what? You can. You can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. You have the skills, the determination, and the professionalism to do it. The other thing that you can do is ask. Ask a woman to run and then support the woman. Once you put yourself out there, if you have the supports, it, it's like you said, then you can do it. You can do, you can do it and have it all, or close to having it all. But women are not often asked. And if you're not asked by someone, you don't think that the support is there. When I decided I was going to run, the support, the overwhelming support was there. I also think it's about role models as well. When I joined the school committee, there were uh, mostly men, and now there's six women on the school committee and one man. And I, I definitely feel like that I made a difference in, in um, sharing with people that the possibility is there that a woman can be on the school committee and be effective. In terms of being mayor, I mean, I, I, I remember ha talking to Mayor Driscoll and saying, Kim, okay, you got three kids, I got two. Mine are seven and 10, yours are seven and 10 and five. How do you do it? And she, she said, I have a rule. I don't go out more than three nights a week. I said, I like that rule. I'm gonna implement that rule. And so it's boundaries, but it really, having a role model in, in a Mayor Driscoll in a neighboring city really helped me kind of solidify the fact that I could do this, that I could make it work in my life, um, and hopefully just in my own community being a role model. And I, th I agree with Kim too, you gotta get it right so you don't wreck it for, <laughs> for those who come behind you, but it is having the role model. So I think it will build. I think what we've done here tonight, the, 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 the women that are here tonight, it will build, it will grow. And I wanna see a mayor in Fall River in New Bedford and Brockton and those cities that have not had a mayor yet, woman mayor. Hi, Carrie Gordon. Um, no political affiliation or affiliation to the school. 
Um, I guess my question speaks to budgeting and these issues that you guys say that you have very close to your heart. What happens when you have a budget shortfall and or <laughs> you just don't <laughs> you just don't have the money to fund some of the things that are close to your heart. What can you do outside of being a mayor to sort of raise that money or what do you do when it just can't happen? I think the thing we have to be is honest about it. There isn't enough money. And we've had 20 plus years of people running for political office who said, you can have what you want and you don't have to pay for it. And so we're running a federal budget now where people are spending money that they don't have doing things that we don't approve of. You know, so it all comes down on the local level. We can't spend money that we don't have. You know, the federal government can do that, we can't do that. And so I have really tried to be honest with people in the city about what we have and don't have and that we collectively have to make choices about what we can and can't do. You know, and that may mean trying to raise taxes on the, on the ballot. We had a heartbreak when we lost an override vote by seven votes. You know, but we had a public discussion about the budget that was very important. I'm going around now, to, I go do this, I didn't do it last year, I wasn't able to, but this year and most other years, I go to every single department in the city and have a conversation with them about what the ingredients of the budget are. So I go to each shift at the fire department, each shift at the police department, faculty meetings at the schools, go to the barn at the DPW at the end of the shift, which is always entertaining, and, and have a really honest conversation about what we can and cannot do. Because there's no smoke and mirrors here. You know, we, there's no other place to go get the money. You know, I'll, I'll be at a meeting in Northampton and people say, well, can't you go to Boston and ask them for money? <laughs> I say, we did that. You know, they don't have the money. And I mean, we are not, we don't have enough money in local government, the way it's currently constituted and the way the money's raised, to do the things that people think we should do. And we need to have a really honest conversation on the local and state level about how we raise and how we spend money and are we doing it the right way. I don't think we're doing it the right way. I think the property tax is broken. I think the income tax is not working quite right. And I don't think casinos, with all due respect to my colleague, are going to solve that problem. We need to have an honest discussion about how we raise and spend money in this commonwealth. I'm a little passionate about that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Denise Peralt. I'm a student. Um, I want to thank two people over here for coming from Methuen. Uh, many times, um, a lot, we're left out of the loop in that vicinity, you know, we don't hear what's going on a lot of times, so I always put a plug in from my area. I want to thank you all for being here, and I'm really glad that um, the Women in Politics and Public Policy got this together. Um, as I was standing in line, I was thinking, maybe I'll come up with the brochure, How to Run for Office with No Money. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, I'm doing a case study on housing, and I wanted to see or hear from all of you about how you're dealing with housing, particularly with people in the income bracket below $40,000. Because I know that HUD calls low income between forty dollars and $50,000, but to me, it's such a conflict of what they're saying, because to me, low income is not forty dollars to $50,000. To me, that's middle income. So I'm just wondering how you're all dealing with the housing issues and how you're helping women, single women, to find housing, people in the low income bracket. Every single day in our office, we deal from abject poverty to multi-billion dollar companies on 128. And some of the hardest things, we have funds for that. But for example, I'll, I grew up in a housing project till I was 13. And people will come in and they're living in hell holes. That's the only way to say it. Now, there is no money. These are state housing projects for years and years and years. So what we did is we took some of our housing money, community development block grant, as well as some of the city money, and we said we can't tolerate this. So we're trying to do the existing housing stock with that. Additionally, because we built eight schools, we have the opportunity to use some of those other schools for housing. Mm -hmm. So it's a long process, but you have to decide on a few priorities. And you have to be realistic what you can do because of the budget and everything else. But you just decide what you really want to do. Now, then you also, I believe, to be honest, it's, it's, it's another thing you say, this is what we can do. When I first became mayor, we had 
95 toys for tots, kids. Well, last year, it was 1,050. Wow. And that's all run through my office, thanks to my staff and some very, very good veterans. And you know what I mean? That's the need. And the need doesn't go away. So you know, in the fo strong form of government, and I'm elected citywide, and I have six councils at large and nine wards, you know, they all come to you, they want this, they want that, and then you ultimately make the priorities. And then you tell them, listen, we might be able to get it to next year, but then you also tell them, no, I can't do this. And that's how we do it. Um, I believe the state of Massachusetts is in crisis for affordable Amen. housing <laughs> and low-income housing. I believe that to be true. What's very unfortunate, though, is, you know, we put out a vehicle such as like Chapter 40B has such a negative stigma, in, at least in my community. The one weakness that my opponent felt um, he had over me was that I supported a project. It was 12, excuse me, 24 units, 12 one bedroom, 12 two bedroom, and it was a 40B project. It was what they call a friendly 40B. And he got some play out of it. Isn't that sad? Affordable housing. We, the town of Weymouth saw 75 foreclosures last month. We'll see 50 this month. It's there, it's real, we need to do something about it, anything possible. Chapter 40R, we're looking at it in the town of Weymouth, looking at our very first development. Hopefully that will come across better because it, it, it brings some revenue into the community and allows some small portion of affordable housing. In my community, I think that's the way I'm gonna have to start. Thank you. Just quickly, I think we're doing all of these zoning incentives and we've created an affordable housing trust fund. Many of the communities have done that, but one of the key things, and, and you, you started to talk about it, was making sure people identify with the affordable housing individuals. Those, those, these are sons and daughters who grew up in Salem who can't afford the housing property there. They're city workers. They're certainly folks who are down on their luck and need assistance, but it's not just um, the, what the picture of, of certain folks have in their mind about the affordable housing advocates. So I stress that. And we, um, we did uh, many of these other things, but we also did a citywide mailing outlining what affordability really meant, and that made a big difference in terms of um, educating people about what does that mean to be, aff uh, to be affordable housing. I am sorry to say we are at the end of the line. We're going to take one more question, though, um, and unfortunately, <laughs> we'll have to wrap it up after that. Go ahead. What's your name? My name is Lainey Driscoll. Um, I'm a I have a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Uh, the 16-year-old is okay. The 14-year-old kind of hates it. Uh, the 10-year-old thinks it's the greatest thing. She goes, first of all, it's, it's very nice having a 10-year-old. People have a hard time saying no to a cute kid. <laughs> and so she, she really, she likes that part of it. Uh, and so on the one hand, they enjoy it. They enjoy the campaigning, and, and the things that they do is they'll do a visibility, they'll do a, you know, some envelope stuffing, and that's okay. What they do find hard is they don't get to see me as much. That's what they find hard. And so I let them come to the office, and they can sit in the mayor's chair and watch the big screen TV and ask to bring it home. Um, but uh, first of all, you... I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, I get it right here? Uh, I'll be quiet. Uh, for, uh, and I, I, sh I should have said, that's a, thank you for asking that question. Because we often talk about what we do, but we never talk about the impact it has on our families. So thank you for asking a very, very good question. It's very hard being the child or a spouse of an elected official. It's harder to be a child of a or a spouse of a mayor because your life is not your own. I'm thinking about coming to what city? Waltham to shop so that I can pick out the Brussels sprouts in peace. 
you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, in terms of campaigning, sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. One of them was chased by a dog. She's never, that's the 14 year old, she will not campaign at all <laughs> anymore. Um, it really varies from time to time. It gets hard sometimes, it really does. It gets, it gets hard for them because they don't get enough, sometimes they feel as though they don't get enough quality time. But Mayor Kirk? Yeah. The, um, for, for my children during the campaign, I was out seven nights a week and I was, again, one of those um, candidates that had no money. I came in in the preliminary 28 votes behind the top out of a field of seven with a hundred dollars in the bank account and I thought I am so, you know, it's just, so it was grassroots. So I was out every single night um, and that was hard on the family. There's no doubt about it. So now I have pictures in my office and they say, Mayor Mommy. <laughs> and they are pictures of City Hall and, and my daughter draws the pictures of all the people who live in City Hall and Mommy lives in City Hall. And, <laughs> and you know, the biggest change probably is that the chil my children now go grocery shopping with my husband because I cannot get through the grocery store. I mean, it's just, you just can't do it. So, um, and that's kind of a treat for the kids. And, and my husband is a journalist, so he's, he's covered elected officials, so it, he's the perfect spouse. I mean, he, there's no fear there. He's very comfortable in the role. But, um, so the children have gotten used to their father a lot, um, which is nice. And instead of being out seven nights a week, I'm now out just three nights a week because of your mom, <laughs> which was great advice. I do. This, I, I think Denise brought it up. Each child's in, uh, different. My daughter um, is is great with the campaigning issues. Um, very supportive. My 16-year-old son. It's it bothers him. He will not go to the grocery store with me. He says it takes me an hour to get a gallon of milk. Yeah. Um, he tells me when we go someplace, I'll say I just have to stop here for a minute. He says, looks at me and says. Your minute is your goodbye tour that takes a half an hour to get out of a building. <laughs> and he said, there's never just a minute. Um, it's hard. The campaign, um, that's actually one, Delaney, you asked such a perfect question. That's one of the reasons I, I chose when we talked earlier about running for higher office and the timing and the opportunity um, for me to, I just got off a campaign and to start again. Um, I honestly, I didn't want to put my family through that right now because it, it takes such time away from them that I really, um, it's a sacrifice, and I'm lucky to have my children that are so supportive. And um, it's hard, and they do sacrifice. And congratulations to you for standing up here tonight and, and getting it. And I'd just like to say thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Um, you're a really cool, inspiring group of women, and I really enjoyed hearing from all of you, as I'm sure everyone else did. So thank you very much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Carol Hardy Fanta. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Allison King, and uh, this may not be a plaque, but it is a Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy thank you gift, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to come and moderate this. Uh, I'd like to give a, a hand of applause to Allison King. And I have to tell a very short story because when I first invited uh, Allison King to be the moderator, I said, you know, we've got these 11 mayors, we're going to invite them, and I, th I, saw, I hope a couple, three, two, three, four might, will come. We were so thrilled that eight of the 11 mayors immediately planned to be here. And we said, we must have hit on something that resonated with women needing to be here in some way. And I was very um, pleased or, to think that we brought some of you together who had never met each other. Mm -hmm. So in here we are tonight really honoring the women mayors, um, but also making the connections possible that we hope will live on past tonight. But I do have to admit that it took me quite a long time until last Thursday when I finally called up Alice and I said, it's not going to be two or three or four people to moderate, it's going to be eight. And so luckily Allison was so gracious and uh, such a wonderful uh, 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 believer in what women are doing uh, in politics that uh, I really do appreciate very much not only your moderating tonight but also your graciousness when I said that there were going to be uh, seven or eight uh, people to moderate, which is a, a challenge. Um, I also want to say that when we inscribed on the plaques that uh, we were honoring you to be, for being an inspiration to the women of the Commonwealth, 
while I knew a, a couple of you, I didn't know the rest of you. And I have to say that I, I think you'll all join me in saying that listening to you tonight, it makes me really believe that you are an inspirational group of women in so many ways. I think that what I heard from you tonight was caring, passion, wanting to make a difference, uh, honesty, openness about what it's like and what you're struggling with. I also heard uh, very forthright answers about the challenges that you face and a real recognition that people, the voters of Massachusetts, need to acknowledge that you are managing thousands of people and probably billions of dollars. And when women are questioned about, well, should you run for mayor, should you run for city council, do you have fiscal experience, you are proof, evidence, right here that you are managing these very practical things. What I heard also was the word exhilarating, that you love what you're doing, that you're committed to what you're doing. And as my husband who's here tonight um, uh, knows, um, my biggest um, praise, because I am a very serious person and work really hard, um, that my most, the best praise I can give someone is that it's fun. And I have to say that listening to you tonight, the laughter I heard in the room, the laughter from you talking about your experiences, I had fun, and I hope you did too, and I hope all of you did. So, <laughs> I hope those of you have time to uh, pick up some of the materials. Um, and I, but I want to thank personally the Honorable Claire Higgins, Mayor of Northampton. the Honorable Kimberly Driscoll, Mayor of Salem, the Honorable Carolyn Kirk, where my daughter lives in Gloucester, the Honorable Susan Kay from Weymouth, the Honorable Nancy Stevens from Marlboro. Sorry, I had to list wrong. The Honorable Jeanette McCarthy from Waltham, and of course, the Honorable, and I'd like to say friend, Denise Simmons from Cambridge. And thank you all for coming tonight, Steve Crosby, thank you for staying for the whole event, and um, to all of you, enjoy the rest of the food, and thank you all for coming and celebrating Women's History Month with us tonight.